All right. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you um, on the Central and East Coast time. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources at the Open Courseware Consortium. And welcome to our, um, our April webinar. And this is actually the fourth webinar. This is the fifth webinar in our series this spring. We had three last month. And um, this is a very special webinar on OER impact research, um, both from the faculty and the student point of view. And uh, this morning, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Rob Farrow at Open University and Quill West at Tacoma Community College. Now, very quickly, um, for those of you who haven't used the Blackboard Collaborate system, on your left-hand side of the screen, uh, you should see a list of participants, um, including yourself. And at the bottom of that is a chat window where you can type in comments as we go along. And we welcome your comments and questions. We will be holding most of the questions until the end of the session. Um, but please do feel free to uh, type those into the chat window as we go along. And we'll answer as we can. And then we'll try and come back at the end and get those. So I'd like to ask uh, those of you uh, who um, have access to the toolbar, which is in the middle of your screen there, uh, if you pick up the little star and drag it over, you can um, one of those icons, you can show us where you're located on the globe. Let's see. So we've got some folks from up in Washington State. Um, if you can't, um, if you can't, um, use those to that toolbar, uh, type in um, the chat window and let us know um, what college you're with or organization. Um, we, we love to hear who joins us at these events because uh, they're open and free to um, all educators and students and interested folks. Great. Thank you for sharing uh, your locations. Um, Looks like, uh, oh my goodness, well, we, thanks Rob. We, um, and of course, uh, Rob Farrow, one of our speakers from the Open University, is over there in Britain. And I did see um, a little star over there which disappeared. Thanks for that. But mostly it looks like we're North America today. All right. So um, after some brief introductions um, and a little overview, we're going to get right into um, hearing from Quill on her Liberated project at Tacoma College. Then we're going to hear from Rob about the community college research that he's done here in the United States um, with uh, various community colleges, over 20 community colleges uh, that he has worked with. And before we uh, continue, I just wanted to mention April is National Community College Month. Um, so another reason to celebrate um, uh, this great research at community colleges by both Quill and Rob. All right, if you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself in the chat window, please go ahead and do that. And at this point, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers um, and let them tell you a little bit about their day jobs. Um, and I'm going to start with Quill West who's the OER Project Director at Tacoma Community College. Uh, she's held that position for the last couple of years. Uh, prior to that, Quill was a librarian faculty at working on the Open Course Library in Washington State. So Quill has had a long, um, a long leadership role within the OER community. And we're very pleased to have her this morning. Quill? Hi, thanks, Una. Um, so I'm Quill West from Tacoma Community College, and I actually have a new title now, um, and we're testing this today. It's Instructional Designer and OER Project Lead, and that is a strategic move on, part of, on the part of our college to take a two-year project and make it a part of um, our ongoing institutional planning and integrate it more with the work that we do in instructional design work and consulting with faculty, and I'm really excited about it. So. Um, our project has been going for about two years, and we have saved students $643,000 to date on textbooks. Wow, that's really impressive. And um, two years ago, you set out with a goal of $250,000, and you've uh, more than doubled that. 
So great work. All right. Next, I'd like to in introduce uh, Dr. Rob Farrow. He is the senior researcher at the OER Research Hub at the Open University in England. But Rob's actually been spending a lot of time in the United States over the last year and a half. Um, it's been three or four trips, right, Rob, that you've made? And um, last October, Rob was with us for almost a month. So uh, say hello, Rob, and uh, tell us a little bit about your day job there in, in England. Hi, thanks, Ina. Yes, so I'm Rob Farrow, and uh, I work at the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University. Um, I'm not really an educational technologist uh, by background. Um, my degrees are actually in philosophy. Um, and I made the switch into educational technology about five years ago. And since then, and since I work at the Open University, I've worked on uh, mobile learning projects, accessibility, um, course evaluations, and some other stuff. So for the last three years or so, I've been working on OER research, previously with the Open Learning Network, and now with OER Research Hub. Um, and so the work that um, I've been doing, uh, we have a team of researchers, and I have the uh, community college focus. So um, partly uh, it's survey-based research, partly it's observations in classrooms, structured interviews, focus groups, very much mixed methods. Um, and as I'll kind of uh, explain a bit later on in the session, there are kind of good reasons why we, we're taking that approach. But it does mean I get to go to the west coast of America for a month, as you say. So you know. It's a dirty job. All right. Thank you, do. Rob. <laughs> All right. Uh, for those of you who might be new to the Community College Consortium for OER, um, our mission is promoting the adoption of OER to enhance teaching and learning. And our, our mission statements, uh, our supporting statements, uh, mirror very much um, community college mission statements. We're all about expanding access to education. And um, we do this. Uh, we do, we do this through supporting professional development for faculty and students who are interested in finding out about OER and how to, how to adopt that in the classroom. And of course, this webinar today is part of that. And um, our focus is the community college, although uh, we do work with the four-year colleges and universities because uh, many of our students do go on to attend those schools. And um, just to let you know, we, uh, we are over 240, uh, I think we're probably at about 250 colleges now in 17 states and provinces. And um, if you aren't a member, uh, we'd love to have you join us. And, um, and, and if you have uh, neighboring colleges nearby and you want to talk to them, uh, you know, send me an email um, at the end of the webinar. I'd be happy to connect you with folks that are doing OER within your area. Um, now, before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on um, why this webinar today and why this is so important. So um, Rob Farrow actually contacted us, well, Rob, Rob's team contacted us a couple of years ago to do OER research work um, at the community colleges. And, we were very excited to work with them because um, we, we are often asked for evidence that OER um, is making um, education more effective, that it's improving student learning, um, it's enhancing teaching, and we all have anecdotal evidence to support that. But in terms of actual research, um, that of course is more difficult to set up. And so we've been very happy to work with the OER Hub to, uh, to do this. And as you know, um, OER uh, research evidence really informs curriculum development. It can inform academic senates in terms of policies. Um, it can inform student advocacy groups uh, around um, promoting the adoption of OER in their courses and when they talk with faculty. Um, it's also very important for writing grant proposals and also for the reports at the other end um, as you're um, supporting the work that you've done. College Board of Trustees are very interested in evidence of OER effectiveness, um, and this helps the whole institution to craft open policies better. And also, as we know, here in California, but quite a number of other states, 
um, our state legislators are quite interested in the effectiveness of OER too, and, and in some cases are uh, writing supportive legislation. So this, this evidence of OER effectiveness really um, has a very wide um, purpose. All right. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Quill to talk about the Liberated Project and with her specific focus on how, how students are impacted by OER. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, the Liberated Project um, is a part of the TCC OER Project, which has been going for about two years. And I think the first thing to know about this project that's really important is that it was funded by our student government. Not entirely, but um, about 50% of the funds um, came from our student government. And that was a process where our administrators um, who were interested in open resources asked the students to fund this project and the students thought it was important. And so I thought, I think um, because it was born out of a kind of administrator faculty student cooperation, it's really important to include the student voice in our assessment of success. Um, so we have a project now, we're calling it We Are Liberated, and it's about student voice. We Are Liberated is all about collecting the student and faculty voice, but mostly the students. If you'd like to see some of the product of this project, uh, you're welcome to visit that website that you see on your screen, and I'll put it in the chat window when I'm um, finished speaking. Um, I often get asked where the Liberated, the name, the title of the Liberated fits within the overall TCC OER project, and so I kind of wanted to give a sense that the OER project includes uh, four parts, um, and a lot of that is the outreach and development and assessment and working with faculty. But the liberated is specifically the work that I do with students, um, and it's the work that it supports the student voice in the project. And I think that's one of the most important things because I think no one has a better perspective on student experience than students. And no one they are often not told what power they have as are the reason why our institutions exist. They often feel like their voices um, don't matter. And they matter the most from my perspective when we're talking about student textbook costs because they're the ones who are bearing the cost. Uh, beyond that, they're also the ones who are in the classroom uh, having to work with these resources on a regular basis. And so it's important to collect their voice. Um, so where the Liberated Project came from, it started with me here at TCC two years ago making a claim. And it's a really well-intentioned claim. It's a very nice claim. I still believe it's true, but I am, um, I am obviously a believer. And so the TCC community asked me to prove myself, prove it, prove that you really are, um, that this is really true, that OER offers greater access to education. Um, that's part of the point of the project. When it started, it was a pilot. It was a chance to get 10 courses and see how it affects student learning, teacher engagement, um, and a host of other things. So um, when I'm making broad claims like this, I have to be able to back them up. And we try to back those up in multiple ways. We track how much money we're saving the students based on how many students are enrolled in classes and how much their the textbook would cost if they weren't if they were paying for it. Uh, we tracked their satisfaction data, so we have an official survey that we use, um, and we send it to the students, and they kind of participate in the Likert scale. And then we look at achievement data. So we're looking at things like how many students completed this course with a C or better compared to students who um, maybe a year ago or two years ago before the OER. So we do a lot of that kind of assessment. But it's really, um, and it's authentic and it's important assessment, but it wasn't getting the voice. I wasn't hearing from the students. So what when when we say a student goes to, to communicate, Tacoma Community College, how are they really feeling about the resources they learn, they use in their classes? Um, so 
I set out to find out. <laughs> um, and one of the first experiences we had with that is um, we were having a, an OER leader come to our campus to talk to faculty, and I thought, it would be really smart to have the students weigh in on that conversation. So we had a student panel, and they said some incredible things about how they choose to learn. Um, and they said some great things about how OER for them was really supplementary material, and they told us that they really associate e-learning and distance learning with open resources, and I wondered if that was going to um, continue throughout the project. So we did that panel, and that was like, I don't know, April of the first year, I think. I started April 1st, and we had that visit like April 30th. <laughs> so we put together a really quick student panel. Um, and then we started surveying the classes. And as part of that, because we were surveying the classes, the teachers started to teach their talk explicitly about their choice of learning resources and why they were using them. And all of a sudden, um, the students were actually having this discussion about the resources. And um, they started to have opinions and wanting to share more about it. So they started writing journal articles, or journal pieces, and they're like just journaling and giving them to me. And so I have this stack of student journals, uh, journal writings on why OER matters to them. And I can use it to assess the project, but I couldn't share it with anybody because it's the student's intellectual property. So we started going to their classes and teaching them about intellectual property and asking them intellectual property and open licensing and asking them to put open licenses on their things, their writings. Um, and that went really well. <laughs> um, so then students started to pick open resources and um, and Creative Commons licensing and textbook choices as advocacy issues in the classes where they were writing papers or doing presentations where they had to pick an issue. Um, and we had some really innovative things. We had a group of students once say that if a faculty member uses a, it makes you buy a textbook and doesn't let you, uh, and you don't use it effectively in the class, that you, as a faculty member, should have to answer to another board of students. <laughs> Which, that's a really authentic student voice talking about their experience. So it wasn't me leading them to any conclusion. Their teacher did not tell them what to think. This is an authentic student voice saying, we still see this as an issue in our education, and we want our institution to do something about it. And we as students want power in that conversation. And um, it was a really wonderful moment for me to hear students take some of the responsibility for what happens in the classroom, but also ask for accountability on the part of the people who are teaching their classes, because that's why we exist. It's what we do as an institution. That's what education is about. Um, so out of that conversation and out of the students saying they wanted a bigger voice and they wanted to share more of their information, we started a qualitative survey where we asked the students to talk about how OER has affected, if they're in an OER class, how has it affected your learning? What has it done for you as a student beyond the price, beyond the cost, the dollar savings? Um, and we started asking for Creative Commons licenses on that. Um, and one of the things that I want to really force uh, mention here is that Rob came, Rob Farrow, who's going to talk to you about this visit, came to TCC um, in October of this year, and we put him in front of a group of students. We put him in front of a public speaking class, and they had a wonderful conversation about what OER means to them. Um, and they shared really cool things about how they like studying on their cell phones, which is something that as an instructor, I um, part of me says, oh, that's how are they ever getting the reading? But this is their experience of studying. And it was really neat to have them have that conversation with an outsider. So we're trying to do more of that. We're trying to bring in people who have no affiliation with TCC to talk to our students because we're hearing better from them what they're experiencing with open resources. So I refer to that as a happy accident. Um, <laughs> and um, that happy accident really was asking somebody who's a leader in OER to come and talk to students directly instead of just um, talking to faculty. Because so often we have those OER leaders come and they talk to our faculty or they talk to our administrators and they do a great job of promoting OER from that perspective. But the student perspective is kind of missing in that. So um, 
we're going to try to do more of that as we go forward. Born out of that was We Are Liberated. Um, so We Are Liberated is our current campaign. We do things like the picture you're looking at on the screen right now is a banner that we had printed for We Are Liberated, or that I printed, um, and we go post it in places where students are and ask them to stand in front of it and tell us um, what they think about open resources. And oftentimes we get, you know, a quick thing about cost. <laughs> um, other times we get real things about their learning. Um, so on the top right you have a student talking about on yeah, on the top right that you're looking at, um, talking about how she liked reading her OER material and how it connected her more with her instructor. So we collect those voices and we put them in um, on our blog when they're willing to share them. And then the other thing that we do is a video, which I think we can, we've created an open, a video called We Are Liberated, where the students stand in front of a video camera and talk about what OER means to them um, and how it affects their learning. And I think Una is going to take over. <laughs> Una, do you, how, can you show that to us right now? This is only a 60 second clip of the overall video and I'm going to put our blog up in the chat window and you can go see it. Okay. Thank you, Quill. Um, I'm going to uh, try this. So um, I'm going to take everybody's screen to this video. And um, you need to click on the play button in order for it to play on your screen. But you will be able to hear it through my microphone. And as Quill mentioned, it's only 60 seconds. So um, if you can't hear it now, uh, you can always use the uh, link that Quill's going to put in the chat window. Uh, and you can listen to the entire uh, video, which is three minutes or four minutes, I think, um, later after the webinar. So here we go. And you want to click on that play button at the bottom. Great about OER is I think that it really allows the teacher to have a little bit more passion about what they choose and that comes out of their lectures. I feel like when there is an OER system in place, their lectures tend to follow it a lot more and help them figure out a lot of reasons. They have to spread with the textbook and reading, we get to interact a lot more. We um, watch a lot of videos and a lot more communication going on. So this whole thing is really cool because I actually don't have to be as bored in class. I know that sounds crazy, but it keeps the whole thing really interesting as opposed to just going through the book and highlighting. We get to watch videos, we get to do things like that instead. We'll keep it. It's a more free scope. And we can really have great in class discussions because there's more articles being posted and more things to talk about. Um, so not only is there much better way to learn, I think it's a pretty good deal. All right. Did did everyone get a chance to watch that or hear it? <laughs> okay. I see two people did. Wonderful. Anyway, it was oh good. And it was I think it was great to hear from those students um, their uh, kind of honest feedback on how it's working for them. So um, do do if you get a chance watch the full one um, after the webinar. All right, Quill. Do you have any finishing remarks? No, I think that's everything that I really wanted to share, uh, and I'll answer questions when we're done with the whole session. All right. So the students got the last word on that one, which is which is a good thing. All right. Now um, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce Rob Farrell, um, who is uh, been the lead researcher um, on the community college collaboration with the OER Hub. Um, and we've been very excited to work with Rob, and he's got some great information to share with you um, based on both faculty surveys that he did with um, our colleges and also um, site visits, um, speaking with faculty, leaders, and students. Uh, Rob, are you ready? I am indeed. Thank you. Yes. Um, thanks for that, Ina. Um, so, uh, yeah, as Ina says, I'm um, doing the uh, research for community colleges as part of OER Research Hub. Um, a little bit about the project and about the Open University to get started with. Um, if you're not already aware of the Open University, 
Uh, we're based in the UK. We've been going since the 1960s. We're the biggest uh, distance learning provider in the UK. I think in Europe too. I'm not sure about further afield, but we're definitely one of the kind of leaders in this in this area. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, we're also one of the um, largest educators of disabled students in the UK. I think we have something like 17% um, of our students have a declared disability from um, uh, cognitive or motor disabilities through sensory impairments. Um, so we do quite a lot of work around um, accessibility as well. Uh, so in the OER Research Hub project, we've been funded for uh, two years, started uh, late in 2012. Um, we're going to be going for about another year, I think. Um, and we're, we're not just looking at community colleges, although that is one of my focus areas. Um, but we're looking at globally, what is the impact of open educational resources? Uh, and so we're working uh, not just with colleges, but also with schools and universities. And we're also interested in informal learning uh, and how informal learning might uh, support formal study. So in terms of recruiting students or retaining students and that kind of thing. And these are all issues that um, affect the open universities as much as community colleges. So um, there's an interest there for us in that. So uh, our own research is structured by a, a set of hypotheses. Now, this is uh, not the most you know, user-friendly <laughs> presentation. Um, so uh, the, the key point here is that there are lots of claims that people like to make about um, OER and the kind of impact that OER has. So for example, OER uh, saves students money. OER improves access to education. OER helps uh, teachers to become better at what they do and so on. So here what you have are 11 hypotheses that, that kind of reflect the claims that people make about OER. And these hypotheses are really the kind of uh, the, the sort of scaffolding for our whole project. So this is what we use to kind of pull everything together. These are all on the website if you, um, if you want to look at them in, in more detail. I'll speak about them as we go on. So um, we have a collaborative model uh, for our project. So part of what we do is work with organizations like CCC OER, um, but also people like Sailor, P2PU, uh, Siavula in uh, South Africa, um, Creative Commons. Um, we've got a very good network that we're trying to kind of um, build up. And uh, uh, it's, it's not just about um, us getting data from people. It's about sharing expertise within that community. Um, and encouraging people to, to be open about what they do, to share the data, uh, and for everyone to benefit from that. Um, and I'll speak a bit more about some of the ways in which openness is kind of informs the way that our project works as we go on. So um, just uh, talking briefly about the, the uh, CCC OER collaboration, um, it has already described a bit of what's happened. I would just like to say at this point, for the record, a great big thank you to Una for all the work that she's done in uh, setting up uh, research visits, setting up surveys, and all these kind of things, which has really made this collaboration uh, work, uh, um, whereas it might not have done. <laughs> it's quite hard sitting in the UK to try and get all this stuff out of people in community colleges in, in the US. So thanks, Una. Um, so around about last February, we started de developing this, the, the, the survey. Um, for us in the, in the UK, that was quite a big task because the, the survey bank had to be applicable to all sectors and all stakeholders. But now it means we've got a pretty good, um, pretty good collection of questions. So around about last May, the surveys started to go live. We, we, we closed them around January this year, but there's still the possibility of, of doing some more because we've now got this extension into next February. So um, if anyone is interested in doing some surveys, we already have the questions. Everything's ready to go. It will pretty much take no time at all. Um, the main issue is uh, IRB, potentially. So um, if we can get around IRBs, then uh, we, there's certainly the potential to do, do more survey collections. Um, and so over the last sort of year or so, I kind of did a bit of traveling around the US, visited some um, community colleges, spoke to a whole bunch of people about what was going on there, and tried to work out how do we actually find this evidence, or what does the evidence really look like for these things? Um, and so we're at the stage now where uh, the survey data has been processed, and I'm going to mainly present that today. And then we also have um, all the recordings, the qualitative data from all these uh, conversations, the visit that Quill mentioned. We were going actually talking to students. Just hearing what they have to say about it. 
So that, it's scheduled for next month to actually go through that and do a proper analysis on it. But I can give you some general kind of things about what I've found. Uh, and the last thing to say is that we're going to be putting all this onto, onto a map, which I'll show you shortly. So here are the colleges that participated in the research uh, over the last 18 months or so. Um, I won't read them all out, but you'll probably see some familiar names on there. Maybe some of these are even your institution. Um, and so some of these have had um, quite a lot of uh, input. And some of them has been a more, more of a light touch, just do a survey, just talk to a couple of people when it happens. But we're keen to build this, um, this network of colleges that are participating up. Because um, part of the way that we're working is to try and um, ensure that when people do, do share data, we add value to that and we share it back to everyone else. So um, just a brief word on the uh, sample that we had for the survey. So um, this, this is kind of composite uh, reporting of um, a number of different surveys put together. So this is the overall um, collection we've got for college educators uh, community college educators in the US. So we had 136 responses, um, at least seven years experience for 84% and 96% had a postgraduate degree. So um, they're, they're not kind of green, they're not kind of just uh, qualified or anything like that. They're experienced teachers and they know what they're talking about. Most of them are teaching full time and some of them are uh, involved in online instruction as well. So uh, we did have quite a kind of mix and a mix from places uh, around the country as well. So um, here you see the, the places that gave data for this survey, De Anza, Foothill, Houston, Northern Virginia, Roan State, and South Florida. Uh, and as I say, we, we, we're uh, putting together the analysis of the qualitative data from the, from the various visits that we've done as well. So on to the um, findings. So first of all, a look at uh, the kind of behaviors that college, edu college educators have around OER. So we asked people just to say whether they've done various things. Have they adapted OER? Have they created OER? Have they added OERs to a repository and so on? So you can see about half of the sample said that they had adapted OER. Um, just about a quarter said that they created OER. One of the interesting things here was if you compare the second uh, column in descending order and the fourth, uh, of those people who create OER, only uh, around half or less than half are actually publishing them on a Creative Commons license. So that was quite an interesting finding straight away. You may not be that surprised to find that because we know that um, it's much easier to create them than to um, take the extra time to license them and, and so on. Um, but it does seem to suggest that a lot of this stuff is happening without open licensing um, being a part of it. Um, looking at the types of OERs that people use, so um, if you look here, at the top, um, videos were by far the most popular OER that people reported using. Um, and then images. So multimedia was the most popular. Going down, down the list, if you look down to the very bottom, data sets, so open, open data where you could kind of take a data set and use it with students to do stats analysis, something like that. Not many people doing that. Um, similarly, not many people using a whole course to teach. So the, the impression is that people are just kind of taking bits, taking things, or maybe they see a video on YouTube and they think this would be good for my students, so they share that. Um, uh, it's, it's not so much people taking an entire course that's already been um, done and mapped to a curriculum and taking that and making that the basis of their own course. Most people don't seem to be doing that. So it's kind of, you know, slightly magpie-ish maybe, you know, taking bits from here and there, very much in the spirit of, of OER and remixing and so on. Um, but uh, uh, you might be surprised there that you know, only just over a third are using open textbooks of these educators where, you know, what we hear a lot is that open textbooks are the, the big thing that's having the impact in, in colleges. So there's a snapshot of kind of the, 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 sort of the types of OER that people are using. Now, if you look at this slide, this shows you the repositories that people reported using. Um, on the far right there, YouTube is by far and away the most popular OER repository. Um, if, you, if you're willing to consider it to be one. Um, then TED Talks, then iTunes U, and only then do we start getting into the kind of Khan Academy, Merlot, if you like, the more uh, well-known sort of uh, core OER providers, where OER is their mission. Um, and, uh, and, and quite low numbers, really, for, for a lot of them. Um, so uh, obviously, we didn't ask about um, local repositories, so people might have um, 
the uh, an institutional repository in their own college and they use that. So we were only asking about the these external ones, but um, but still it wasn't really what I expected to see. So moving on, um, we asked people uh, what what factors were relevant to how they choose OER. So the most popular answer here was the resource being relevant to um, particular needs or interests. I guess you could call that perceived relevance. Um, the second most important factor was whether or not they trusted the institution or person that had created the OER. So that does seem to be important, the idea that um, the, 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 an institutional or a personal connection can be a proxy for the quality of a resource. But maybe not that surprising. After all, that's kind of how it works with textbooks and, and so on. So that's not a uniquely open thing. Um, only just over half said that having an open license was um, a significant factor for them. So um, again, we see that kind of slight discrepancy between the, the theory and the practice of, of using OER. So, um, so we have some other uh, um, other factors mentioned in the uh, in the in the body there. If you go down to the bottom where I've um, highlighted the last two. So the resource featuring a catchy title or attractive image, 9%. So um, that, this seems to me to be kind of an interesting kind of outcome because one of the things that uh, some people uh, will say is a another proxy for quality is the kind of presentation of something. So if something looks nice, you know. Um, and you know, as we'll see, there are people with worries about the quality of, of OER, but those worries don't seem to translate into the presentation. So people don't seem to mind it if it's kind of a bit rough around the edges. Um, and the, the bottom response there, being required to use OER to complete a project or task, only 7% said that. I guess you could read that two ways. You could say, no one's really being required to use OER, so it hasn't kind of really got into the, the, the mainstream of what people do. Um, but on the other hand, 7%, that's you know, not insignificant, because how many institutions are actually asking people to, to use this stuff? So, um, so yeah, an interesting finding. Um, interesting. Anyone's got any thoughts on that? So, moving on. Now, we're looking at the um, impact uh, on teachers and students. So, we asked. Uh, we asked. These are obviously these are all questions that are asked of educators. We didn't ask students in these in these surveys. This is the teachers' perception of how it's impacting on them and on their students. So, this uh, chart shows. Uh, we are. You know, we asked people to say whether they agreed with these statements. So OER use, does it make, uh, do you now, as a result of your OER use, make more use of culturally diverse resources and so on? So what you're looking at with the blue is agreement and the red is disagreement. Now the first thing that you should take away from this uh, graph is that these are all positive pedagogical um, indicators. Right? So these are all things that people associate with better teaching. Um, we have a hypothesis which is to do with critical reflection. Um, so we're interested in, does OER use make people reflect more about what they do? Do they think more about their teaching? Do they spend more time preparing and so on? But it's hard to look at that directly. So this, these, are our, these are, again, these are our proxies for that. But you can see there's much more blue than red. So there's much more agreement with these statements than disagreement. And they're all positive, right? So people think it's having a positive effect on their teaching. Um, so making more use of culturally diverse resources uh, was the one that had the, the strongest agreement. But the one that had the most agreement um, was the fourth one down, up-to-date knowledge of subject area, and the second one down, collaborating more with colleagues. So uh, North Seattle College ICT skills are information and communication technology skills. Um, but more collaboration with colleagues, that is, again, something that um, uh, people like to claim about this stuff. And we, we, we see it happening. We see people collaborating on textbooks and sharing stuff. Um, and this supports that, um, that view. Um, now, there was quite a lot of, um, if you like, the least agreement was around ICT skills. So um, there were quite a few people who didn't agree that their ICT skills were improving um, as a result. Um, and similarly, looking at the, the sort of second last um, row there, I reflect more on the way that I teach. So you can see that there was, um, you know, a significant number of people didn't really agree with that either. So there are some people who think it's having more impact and some people think it's having less impact. Um, but overall, that seems to be the perception is that it's having a positive impact on teaching. So moving on to the next slide and um, looking at students. 
So this is the perception of the teacher uh, of what's happening with the student. Um, and so we ask them, again, do you agree or not? And again, these are positive. So uh, when people agree, they're agreeing with, with a kind of positive thing. Um, so you can see here, the, the, the strongest one, in terms of the strongest agreement, was that OER is increasing people's sense of experimentation with their own learning. Um, the one that had the, mo the most agreement, rather than the strongest agreement, was this idea that it leads to a wider interest, uh, sorry, interest in a wider range of subjects. Um, and the third one down there, developing independence and self-reliance. Now these are all really good things. Right? These are things that are hard to um, to get people to adapt to and to change their way of learning and become more responsible for their own learning. So again, these are quite positive, quite positive findings. Um, and you can see here we're talking about 60% agreement with these things. Um, so um, again, these are all positive: increased enthusiasm for study, more satisfaction with the learning experience, building confidence, and so on. Um, the one that you could argue had the least agreement was increasing enthusiasm for future study, which is about five up from the bottom there. So you can see the red there, but it's still less than 10% of people that disagreed. So again, um, positive, uh, probably slightly, slightly more positive than the impact on teachers, arguably. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's good stuff in the sense that it's, it's all going in the right direction. So um, moving on to the uh, financial savings. So we asked people whether or not their institution is saving money through OER. So you can see here, 44% agreed, yes, it has. Um, and uh, only 19% said no. Um, understandably, perhaps, there's quite a lot of don't knows. Not everyone has access to that information. Um, it's not always maybe uh, that clear how OER might be saving an institution money. Um, it might depend on the, the various deals that are in place, especially with, you know, with bookshops and that kind of thing. But overall, it's a positive finding. Most people agreed. Um, looking at the comments that people provided, um, partly there's this idea that you know students are coming back and 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 they're staying in school. It's not a direct institutional benefit. Um, sorry, not not a direct financial benefit for the institution, but indirectly, it's a great benefit because if you've got people taking the classes, then that's how you make your money. Um, you've got this comment on the on the, on the um, uh, bottom right, um, some instructors are only using OER, which provides savings for students. So some people are getting um, getting at that level of the conversation where they're trying to work out before they make their decision. Am I going to do this? Or am I going to do that? Which one's saving money for students? If you look in the bottom left, um, this, is, this is one of the negative comments, um, which you may recognize as a sort of slightly old-fashioned, maybe, view of OER. Um, or uh, you know maybe someone who's not really in the loop about kind of the resources that are out there because as we know there are very up to date modern resources that are peer reviewed and aligned to curriculum so um, so I mentioned that mainly just to not to agree with those sentiments but just to tell you that there are people out there who who do think that way and I guess they're the people who who need convincing so anyway um, institution saving money about 44% said yes. Moving on to um, where the students have saved money. So um, you can see here, 62%, almost two thirds, said yes. Uh, there's um, the uh, looking at the comments. Um, bottom right, uh, someone says that they, they reckon they're saving their students about $100 each. Uh, and that's a figure that I've had come up in various places that I visited, about $100 per student per class. Um, if you want a kind of rule of thumb, uh, roughly how much would it save? $100 per student. Um, interested to know if anyone's got kind of, uh, uh, any, you know, if they agree with that figure or they think it's too high or too low. Um, but this is quite positive. Two, two thirds roughly say that students have saved money. Not is there the potential to save money, but yes, they have actually saved money. So um, we also asked about student retention. So this is going back to this issue of whether we are can actually encourage um, people to stay in college. So um, less agreement with this, so about 50% not sure, but still 20% um, uh, agreed, 12% strongly agreed, put them together, that's over a third so agree that OER use is promoting retention. Um, and I'll say something about the reasons on, on the next slide. So um, but about half feel is not having an effect. So um, I mean, one, one way you could look at this is to say, well, 
okay, there's OER and there's the practices that surround OER. Um, and maybe it's not just enough to sort of stick a CSU license on something, but also to think more about kind of how the how the openness of what you're doing can um, influence um, and change the way that you're uh, the way that you're educating. So, um, but again, there's still that kind of uh, 10, 12 percent of people who who disagreed, um, and some of them disagreed strongly. Um, but yeah, I think um, still a kind of you know a positive result, certainly not a negative result. So this is um, we asked about the factors that um, would be important um, when, when in terms of retaining students, um, and you can see here that the the top answer was the reduced cost of study materials over there on the on the uh, on the right. Now, one thing you might have noticed about this graph is that the number of people who think OER can be a promoter of student retention is greater than the number of people who think it is a promoter of student retention. So, going back to the last slide, uh, you've got twelve percent disagreement, but uh, sixty percent. Sorry. You've got about 33% agreement, um, but 60% of people say that it can be a factor. So, um, so there's probably more people who think that it can be an important um, promoter of student retention than people who think that it that it is. So, what I mean by that is to say that the the people who uh, the people who are not convinced yet and maybe are still open to the possibility. So here are some of the comments that we got about this. Um, so some people will say, if you look at the bottom right comment, look, retention is nothing to do with this. You know, it's just to do with time, insufficient preparation. It's not about the books. It's not about the resources. Um, there's obviously there's the the the, the idea that you can't. Yeah, we, I'd agree with you. You know, it, it is complicated. Um, the uh, the factors are also not the same in, in, in different places as well. So it's hard to draw a very sort of firm picture from around, around this. But um, at the same time, I think uh, there's a slight thing here, which is about technology and about access to technology. So the people who said that OER isn't the solution were pointing mainly to um, people's inability to use the technology in the first place or people's uh, Inability to access technology in the first place, and these things being more important for student retention. So maybe OER isn't the thing that makes the difference there, but if if these other factors are more important, OER certainly fits in quite nicely there as as part of a coordinated approach. So moving on to open licensing. Um, so we asked uh, how many how important is open licensing. Thirty four percent said very important. Um, Twenty percent said crucial. If you look at those two figures together, that's higher than the number of people who actually do it. Um, so, if I if I said at the, at the, at the very start that we had um, uh, about 11% of people practice open licensing, but you've got here 54% of people thought it was uh, at least very important. So, you know, that seems significant. Um, two interpretations. One could be that they that people don't feel that comfortable doing the licensing, or they don't quite feel confident about how it works, or that kind of thing. Um, another another explanation could be that they uh, they just don't have the time to do it, basically, um, and it's just a, an extra bridge too far to license it on top of actually producing it and using it. Um, so I mean, an interesting finding there about you know how how important is open licensing to all of this? Is it the thing that makes it all happen? So just to pull some of this stuff together, um, most of the respondents we asked have used OER, but only around a quarter actually create OER. So uh, most reported positive effects on teaching practice, uh, mainly around peer collaboration and improved subject knowledge, but also around increased independence and self-directed learning. Um, a small proportion uh, feel that OER use leads directly to improved teaching practice. Uh, positive effects also identified for learners, um, as I say, around self-reliance 
and experimentation and increased interest in the subject. So uh, about two thirds of people felt that students would save money, less agreement um, around whether institutions were saving money. About a third believe that OER is improving, uh, well maybe I should say improving student retention rather than attrition. Uh, about half believe it's not having an effect. There are only around half of OER creators used open licensing. So you have um, adapters or about half the sample, uh, creators about a quarter of the sample, and about 12% of the sample using open licensing. Um, and there, there are some people within that sample who um, are very sort of, if you like, the sort of OER power users. So they're doing all the things they're supposed to do. They're licensing, they're uploading to repositories, they're uh, reflecting more on their practice um, and they're kind of very sort of pro OER. But then at the other end of the uh, of the scale, there's the kind of, um, maybe anti OER is too strong, but people who sort of want to be convinced, um, maybe is a better way of putting it. Uh, one thing briefly, just to mention, um, uh, coming out of this work, is about the, the importance of a sort of a timely IRB process. So if you do want to do any um, any research like this, so you want to use our own survey questions and that kind of thing, get on top of your IRB process as soon as you can. Um, so just sort of what's happening next with this stuff, um, so we have some time for questions. So uh, we've got some more work to do on this on this survey data, but we've also got to cross-reference it with our other surveys. So for instance, we have a sailor survey with um, about 3,000 responses. Um, that's all informal learners, some of whom are college students as well, some of them are using Sailor materials to get through their college courses. So once we kind of put that together with this and some other surveys that we've got, we're going to get a nice um, online, oh, Phil, it's uh, Institutional Review Board, uh, ethics panel, basically. Sometimes it's called a, a, student, a student research panel and these kind of things. But it's basically where you get your ethical approval from. Um, we have some stuff to do around um, trying to pull together the qualitative data that we've got. And we're also really interested in inter institutional metrics uh, where we can find them. That is the gold dust. That's what's really hard to get where a college can say, well, we've got these students using OER and these students not using OER, and here's the difference between them. Um, that's what's very hard to get. Um, so yeah, anything like that that you might have would be great. Um, all the data is being disseminated openly, so uh, we're currently working out ways to publish all, this, all the raw data online. Um, and we, all of our research instruments like surveys and interview questions and stuff like that, that's all free for anyone who wants to have it, it's all openly licensed. Um, we would ask that you share the data back with us, but that's not up to you really. Um, just to finish on this map that we're producing, um, if you want to go there, it's uh, oermap.org. You can go there now, it's, it's live. Um, but I've got some slides just to show you what's going on there. So um, when we find evidence of OER impact, we're recording it on this map. And we're uh, doing it in such a way where if you look at in, in the sort of bottom left quadrant of this slide, this flow diagram, you have the hypotheses running down the left, the sectors that we look at on the right, and in the middle, you've got positive and negative evidence. So we've got a picture there of kind of what's happening overall. You can see most of our evidence, uh, positive evidence about financial saving is, is coming from the college sector, running from green to top purple at the top there. Um, you can see if you look at the sort of bottom left, C, access, um, the evidence there is split. So we've got some negative, some positive. Most of the negative evidence is coming from the informal sector. So that's, that's to do with, um, sort of MOOC claims about improving access turning out to not really be that justified. So we've got a way of kind of trying to capture the whole kind of world uh, picture in one. This is the idea. But you can go um, further into the data on the map as well. If I go to the next slide, um, you can see the United States there. And um, the, the, the flow map, um, the, the, the sort of diagram in the bottom left, that updates automatically when you select a country. So you can see how the, the picture is different in different countries. But you can also go through to um, a sort of fuller map, which is a bit more like a Google map. Um, so here you see OER projects that we've got. Um, moving on to the next one, 
Here's the evidence for community colleges in the USA that's been entered into the system so far. Orange is positive and silver is negative evidence. Um, and you can see here, if you look at the top of the slide, you've got drop down boxes where you can filter all this stuff. So if you just want to see, right, show me financial savings for colleges and positive evidence. Um, you can filter out that stuff. So you can see straight away where is the impact happening, where is the evidence being found. Um, when you click on any of these nodes, by the way, you, you get taken through to a WordPress blog style report or um, summary. Um, another map that we've got, this is the uh, policy map. So what you're looking at here are policies that have been entered into the system where um, R indicates uh, a regional or local. Um, uh, I is for international, N is for national, and uh, I forgot the other one, but there's four of them. And um, the idea there is to sort of record all these policies, and we're trying to sort of, sort of, if you like, work out is there a kind of correlation between where the policies are in place and where we find the evidence, and which comes first, and this kind of thing. So it's about trying to draw that picture together, and also provide something that's of use to people to go and if they're talking to a policymaker or a dean or, or a government official or anything like that, and you want to show people this is what's happening, this is the impact, the idea is this is a tool uh, for you to use as much as it is for us. So that's the policy map. Um, but I encourage you to go and have a look around the site. This shows you the, the summary at the moment of what we've actually got into the system. You can see we're, we might have, we're more focused on positive evidence, and we've got quite a bit of it. Um, but we're in the process of, of, of seeding this data. We will be doing it all over the whole summer. So we're expecting to have quite a, quite a few hundreds of pieces of data in there, as well as our own um, surveys for people to explore themselves. So um, quite a lot there. If you want to go and check it out, oermap.org. So just to conclude, in terms of what we're doing, the um, the real point of all this is to build up the evidence base for everybody. So it's for everyone to use. And the idea is that if people share with us, um, we can kind of pull everything together into one place and um, share that back to the community. And the idea is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So the more people share with us, the more this evidence base grows, the more, um, the, the, the more easy it becomes to make a case that you can take to your dean and say, we should be moving in this direction because look what's happening there. Or even if you just want to get in touch with them yourselves and, and, and do it that way, that's fine. So um, the last thing to say, I suppose, is that we want to put you on the map and your college, find out what's happening in your situation. So by all means, um, drop me a line, get in touch with the project, and um, yeah, just let us know what's going on. Let's have a conversation, and we'll see if there's any way that we can help in what you're doing. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Rob. Lots of, lots of uh, comments and questions in the chat window. Um, I'm going to take us real quick through just a couple slides. Uh, by the way, the Open Courseware Consortium, our parent organization, is having a conference the end of April in Ljubljana, Slovenia, which is just a beautiful country. The registration is still open. <laughs> um, and a few of us from the community colleges are going, and we'd love to see more. Um, I mentioned that next uh, month in May, uh, Wednesday, May 14th, we're going to have a webinar specifically on open licensing and also trademarks and patents. Um, and we're going to have Kathleen Omolo from Open Michigan who is quite expert in this area, and she's going to share with us. So uh, come and invite uh, your faculty to that one. And at this point, um, I know we're uh, very close on the hour, but we're going to go ahead and open up for questions. Um, and I want to thank everyone for coming and thank my uh, speakers for their uh, wonderful information today. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, there has been um, Quite a, quite a lot of interest around surveys, um, and, and Rob's email is there if you want to contact, contact him. We also at the consortium, you can contact me at my Una Daily um, uh, email. Um, I, um, I share surveys from our other members, um, who uh, surveys that they use for both students and faculty, um, and so I'm happy to share those with you. Uh, Quill also has um, some wonderful surveys that I usually share with her permission. Um, so do contact us for that. Um, and I do understand we had a comment from Anita about, um, I think it was Anita, um, who said that uh, many of um, her faculty are interested in this new 
uh, open education movement, but they don't really understand open licensing and OER, and how can her surveys address that uh, without confusing people? And so, um, something you know we'll probably try and talk about in May, but we're also happy to work with you, Anita, on on your survey questions. Um, one question we had from SPSCC eLearning was faculty collaboration. Uh, and Rob, did you want to speak to that as an outcome? Um, how facu were faculty collaborating more because of OER? Um, did the survey show that? Yeah, well, um, I would say we got some supporting evidence for that. Uh, we have a couple of um, places that we're thinking about following up and doing sort of bigger sort of case studies on. Um, but there's certainly, um, uh, we, I mean, we asked, uh, if I just open up the slides, because there was one of the slides this came up on. So we asked people um, when we were asking about impact on teaching, um, and they, there was certainly 22% 22, 22 said that um, they collaborated more with colleagues. And uh, something like a further 50% agreed. So yeah, 22% strongly agreed, and a further 50% agreed. So there's some evidence there to suggest that that's happening. But we don't know exactly what kind of collaboration that is. So whether that's collaboratively producing texts or working out curriculum and you know these kind of things, it, it, that's an open question. But there's certainly some supporting evidence. There for that claim. Thank you, Robin. And, and I will say that um, the Community College Consortium has also done some, did some previous research back in the 2010-2011 timeframe that supported um, increased faculty collaboration. Um, but I don't think it's uh, so. There has been supporting evidence for that. Was there a question? Um, Thank you. Rob has shared the full set of survey questions there. Um, and um, I know that we had at least one question here who, uh, one question, I believe this was from Ashley, and she said, um, it, Rob, is there going to be a report on um, these findings that could be shared with administrators because her administrators won't have the time to, say, watch the recording of this presentation? Uh, yes, there will be reports. Um, quite what format they'll be in, I don't know yet, to be honest with you. Um, Do we're you know kind of time frame, Rob. Yeah, so we'll be entering our kind of um, final dissemination phase uh, in the fall this year. So between so now and sort of August, we're going to be so. So we, we obviously we've got conference presentations coming up at OCWC and OER 14. So once these are out of the way, we get a bit of time to just kind of go back and pull everything together properly. So by September, that's when we're going to be kind of pu pushing stuff out there. Um, I think it's quite possible there'll be some sort of maybe uh, sort of, you know, a brief glossy report on this stuff, but I don't know yet. Um, at very least, there'll be an e in a sort of e-book, a short e-book or something like that. Um, but it'll be widely available. Um, these slides um, will be online as well on the website if you want to see them. Or you can just get in touch with me, and I can give you a few slides that will give you the, the kind of basics. Um, of the, you know, if that's what you something in particular that you want to sort of share with people. Um, but but everything will be out there sometime this year. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, and I think yeah, these slides and there's a fuller deck of slides that are available. Um, either email me or Rob uh, for that information um, on this presentation, which may work in the interim. Um, let's see. Um, we are just about running out of time because um, I don't want to hold our captioner um, much beyond the hour. So, um, I, Quill, do you have any um, concluding remarks that you would like to make before we turn off the recorder? No, other than contact me for questions, and and I'm always happy to answer them via email. Um, yeah, that's what I'll stop with. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Quill, and, and of course, thank you, Rob, um, as well, for your presentations. And I just wanted to mention that uh, Phil Vendetti um, is attending our session today. He's a um, communications professor at Clover Park Technical College, and several of his students are with him. And um, they've been posing some interesting questions in here as well in the um, 
and we'll just take one of the students' questions. Leighton is eager to know how people who use OER are able to reach out to provide access to others who are technologically challenged. Um, so good question. Um, good question, uh, Leighton, about um, students helping others who are technologically challenged. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to stop the recording right now on that one. But um, Quill, do you do you want to take a shot at that one? I was talking.